Are they working to their image? Yes, the actors are in a sound studio at a cost of $400 an hour, uh, and they are watching their image on the screen, and there are beeps that, that when, when the first line of dialogue starts, it's a third beep, so it goes beep, 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 and then it's open, and they work to match their lips. Can you adjust their speed in post-production? A little bit. Um, in terms of if it doesn't quite match, you mean making yeah. it match? Yes, that with computer technology and digital technology. That was not true in the old days. When I, when I did my sound editing for the first feature film I did, Where the Rivers Flow North, I had seven sound editors working for six weeks, each of whom had a different angle. One, one was doing just effects, one was doing dialogue on these two characters only. And it was hugely costly. Um, now, one sound editor does the whole thing. And then we go into the lab, to, we go into the studio to do re-recording. All the actors have to do a lot of re-recording. You can also adjust performance through this. So if an actor isn't quite you know, articulating emotionally the way you would like them to. Do you, do you find any advantage in that process from having a field recording? Yes, absolutely. The field recordings are always important, and so they can guide the performance. Often, sometimes you lose your best performance because the plane flew overhead, and well, all you want to do is get what you had. And so, generally speaking, you do, but not always, and that's the most frustrating thing. How many days of filming did it take? Um, 26. Pretty fast. Especially when you consider students were involved and everything else, which does slow down a little bit. So everything had to be, you know, you just have to, it's a constant battle for time, every day. Um, one of the advantages of working with a, with a crew that's largely students is that it's, it's the best ambient crew to work with. Because the kids are totally inspired and charged up. And, you know, whereas you may teach classes and they don't show up, okay, you know what I'm saying? That does not happen on this project. You know, they are there, they are ready to go, and, it's, and they are excited about it. And the a professional's job is to mentor these kids and to be generous. And it's just much better, frankly, than an all-professional crew, which is complaining about the food, or, you know, we, we will literally charge you an extra thousand dollars if you're 15 minutes late for lunch. Now, there's still a courtesy that goes on. If you have to be 15 minutes late for lunch, you ask permission, you know, of all the department heads and the crew needs to be on board with. There's a lot of protocol on, on a movie set. But you don't get fined, which you do on a regular crew, you know. Now, we don't want to exploit the crew. We, you know, we don't do this. We, you know, we, but if you're in the middle of, if you're, if you're down to two more takes to get out of the scene, you don't want to go to lunch for 45 minutes and come back to that. You have to start something else. And so there are all these rhythms of production. But yeah, 20, 20 I think we actually had two extra days. Uh, there was some camera malfunction. I think we had actually 28 days. Um, so that's basically how we cast it through auditions in New York, except for Gordon and Jacqueline. Um, and uh, I was pleased with the cast. Uh, you know, some people come away and say, oh, why did you go with, why did you go with John? You know, that guy. I'm so upset that she didn't go down. Good. <laughs> That's the way I feel about it. Good. That's what it's supposed to be about. Uh, anyway, so, and Shane, who plays John, really, this is this really his first film. This is also uh, Diane's first film, really. She had done this TV stuff on Orange. This was a huge challenge for Lucia. I thought she did a great job. Yeah. You know, she worked very hard on it. Anyway, other questions? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, students travel with us to locations. They don't really know what to do once they're there, to a large extent. Uh, and these were locations. I mean, the Kosuke, the, the pond where they have the picnic, you know, required bivouacking uh, on all-wheel vehicles as close as you could get, and then another half hour of walking through sand with with 
ties moving in that particular area very quickly. And so it was, it's, it's fabulous. And the minute I saw this location, I said, this has to be the location. It also is on conserved land where there is a policy against allowing filming but the fact that we're nonprofit and educational, the Nantucket Conservation Foundation allowed us to go there. So all of this was negotiated, you know, but I just knew that spot was just unbelievable. And um, so, no, I mean, generally speaking, you know, the, the crew goes and visits sets and, and students were along with that. And uh, we, you know, ultimately I do make those decisions and we talk about it and we have discussion and you can have debate and all the rest, but, but ultimately, you know, it is my, my uh, decision. My job as the, as the sort of director and producer of the project is to bring the students as far forward as I can and to be open to anything they have to say at any time. The other thing is they, they have the power, they have the ability to screw up and they, they are not chastised for that. You know, they can't be, that can't be part of the game. So it's just, we expect there to be errors and we expect there to be problems. So the costumes weren't brought to them, is it they were created? No, the costumes, the costumes were not created. This would have been an unbelievable task to create all those costumes. So costumes were brought from Los Angeles, from the costume collection in New York, uh, through the Theater Development Fund, through the Mount Holyoke uh, costume collection, since Mount Holyoke is one of the schools that participates, the Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut, and two costumes were brought from London. So it was a very particular costume pull, but uh, they were all rented. And they were rented at a cost of I'm trying to remember. I think it's about $400 per costume rental. They're not cheap. And the, and the damage, I mean, the costumes are valued like $10,000 a piece. Oh, yeah. and, and the hatware and stuff that was shown on, on that came with the show? Or did you age from that one? Um, costumes, I mean, Jack, Jack, Jacqueline's costumes would not have been aged. They, they, were, they were as they were, which tended to be antique costumes. They're antique costumes. Can, can you speak to what was from the original book and what, what had to be translated sure. to the Nantucket scene? Yeah. First of all, we worked with 19th century translations of the, of the French, which was part of what we also set to do to try to, 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 to maintain that sense of language. And the main revelation through that was that language was becoming pretty modern by this time, actually. This is not 1810. This is a significantly different period. And after the Civil War, you know, I mean, and, and you think of who was writing. I mean, Henry Ibsen was writing then, and uh, Oscar Wilde was writing. I mean, there, there was interesting sort of language stuff that was learned, I think, by doing it. But um, the book, I mean, the, the big thing, the, 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 the love interest is very slight in the book. We developed that substantially. And she is not someone who came to the island. She was someone who was hanging out on the island, and it was Louise who essentially shoehorned her into the family. And John, why don't you, you know, take a look at this gal? I think that in the book, Peter is a bit of a misogynist. We pulled back on that, uh, and also gave that. In the book, one of Maupassant's ongoing interests is on the impact of combat on the island, <coughs> and, and using the, Fran the Franco-Prussian War as the template. And, so, uh, so you have them as Quakers. We have them as Quakers, because we're using all New England, Nantucket, American reference So you have them as entree into being more of a pacifist. That's right, that's right. Was so that story. Was the book? No, no. not at all. Uh, Peter was, was a war veteran, but didn't really go into it much. Some of Mopassant's other work does, but, um, but I knew this to be a theme that interested him, and it always, it's always interested me because I think the Civil War is largely unresolved in our culture. And so the chance to, to work with it a little bit and to develop a story that had a bit of an unusual Confederate character and a bit of an unusual Union character sort of interested me. I hope it works, you know, but certainly the pacifist background, the story of the steamer coming in with, that everybody showed up and it was a holiday until they see the flag at half mast and six caskets on the deck, that's an actual story of Nantucket. And that's what motivated Peter to go and the story of pacifist, a lot of research was done into the, the role of medics and whether medics were known to have treated enemy soldiers at all. And it, 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 not much is told, but there is evidence of it. You also have uh, Walt Whitman, who was a, was a medic, uh, who treated uh, Confederate soldiers also, although he clearly was aligned with the Union. 
So that was sort of interesting, you know, to try to work with that idea and the idea that he wouldn't be public about that. But that when you're out there on the field and people are dying and it's two, you know, 24 hours since the battle was fought, you know, and it's just, what do you do? You just go out to the screens. And we had some additional references. Some soldiers would go to the edge of the battle and sing songs out to the wounded soldiers just to respond to the, to the wails and, and moans that they were hearing. Uh, so that, so all of this was part of the research we did. So all of that is <clears throat> particular to the story. However, the relationships, the father, I mean, that dialogue, a lot of it is straight from the novel. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that in the novel, I would argue that Charles, whose name in the novel is Jeremiah, just seemed to me a little bit off. Charles uh, is a little bit more of a goofball and a little more clueless in the novel. However, the question is, does he know about the adultery? Who thinks he knows? Okay, who thinks he doesn't know? Yeah, I think, it, you know, I, I wanted to keep it so it could go either way. But even in either case, I wanted Charles to be, uh, there, to, there's a level in which he is awkward, but there's a level in which he is not really totally suited for this woman. But that it's okay. You know, and so that's sort of what I was working for there. In the novel, um, Charles is a jeweler, and Louise simply tends to the shop and, ha and falls into this adultery through that. In some ways, to me, the Nantucket story, which is that he was a whaling, he was a whaler, where he would leave for three and four years at a time and come back. I mean, it was not uncommon for whalers on Nantucket to come back and see two kids sitting there. <laughs> and there was a social practice on Nantucket which was to not stigmatize these kids. It was accepted. Now, there were emotional complications, I have no doubt. But these women, they also, they make a big deal of the fact that they've been excavating some homes lately and they find sexual devices in the walls of these ancient homes. <laughs> you know, that women apparently use, but that's a whole other story. Um, so anyway, so we, we put, we, so the idea of him being a whaler, the idea of the guy being a whale oil broker who would have been the guy financing the family's three year period while he was gone, I mean, it just, it all sort of actually fit pretty well as far as I was concerned. And makes in some ways the adultery less, in some ways less overtly transgressive. And even to the point where Charles whether he liked it or not, would have to accept it. And of course he says, after 11 years, I was done with this. And there were those guys. This was brutal. I mean, you know, I think about the northern New England cowboys who were the loggers. And I've done movies about loggers. But the whalers? Whoa. You know, and, and, and Nat Philbrick, who wrote, um, what's the story they just did, made a new movie, Ron Howard? Heart of the Ocean. Heart of the Sea. It's a Nantucket story, and he was helpful to us. Uh, the first thing he said to me, you know, post, you know, 1872 Nantucket, the, the red veterans from the war would be drug addicted, a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so we had that sort of a little bit of subtext there, which is something Nantucket itself hasn't really addressed much. But he said his research says it clearly. You know, that it was such an epidemic that half of the soldiers coming back were dependent on opium. Mm -hmm. But, uh, he wrote about these whalers and they would stop in the Galapagos Islands on their way to the Pacific and they would stockpile like a hundred Galapagos turtles on the boat so that when they ran out of water they could drink the blood of the turtles. <coughs> and it's like, <laughs> don't tell me anymore. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so that was interesting. And so the idea that Charles made some money, but he said, that's it, and decided to just throw it in and you know not continue making that kind of so there were, there were certainly changes. Those are some of the major changes. So Lucia was basically our creation almost entirely. And I, I, um, but we found that oral history of that woman, and that interested us. I think the process whereby you create your art using students at a college and all of these resources is, is absolutely fascinating. The quality you're able to generate. Um, but I had some interest in the, the long term um, life and longevity of your films. I mean, Northern Borders came out at the same time Nebraska did. We saw you here a couple years ago. We saw Nebraska later. 
same character, Bruce Stern played the same person. I thought your movie was better. Their movie got nominated for Academy Awards and probably made a lot of money. What happens to Northern Borders over the last two years? Is it available? Did somebody buy yeah, it? Yeah, I've got some DVDs right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I signed my name, right? 20 bucks. It's no, no, that's a $20 item. I, some of them, i got to differentiate. I, I can't even quite figure it out. But, <laughs> you know, anyway, no, Northern Borders and, and Peter and John and Where the Rivers Full North and Disappearances are here for, for 20 bucks a piece. Uh, they have Stranger in the Kingdom and Windy Acres and, and Playbills that are free for anybody that, you know, that signs over their line. Um, well, you know, this is this is interesting question, you know, because I mean the truth is that in order to make film that functions profitably within the system which is totally dominated by Hollywood, you must be within that bubble. Uh, and even then, frankly, you know, I mean, as Martin Sheen once said to me, the only thing creative left in Hollywood is the accounting. <laughs> um, <laughs> Northern Borders has gone has gone into release. It's on Netflix. It's you know okay. lining up to go to Showtime. I mean, it's done about six hundred thousand dollars worth of business for the distributor, and we have not received one nickel. Okay, that's the bottom line on this on Northern Borders right now, which is why I spent two years touring the picture in New England, and I'm in no hurry to give it over. Okay, so Showtime will pay for a three-year license. They'll pay ten thousand dollars for show for Northern Borders. If I were Canadian, the film by law would have to get a minimum of $800,000 for television. So it's a buyer's market that completely exploits independence. And how could I get over that? I don't know. I mean, Bruce Dern, frankly, would be the first person to say that, that frankly, uh, the character in Northern Borders interested him more than the character in Nebraska. You know, and that the work he did with us is what got him prepared to audition and play that part. As he said to me at one point, all Northern, all Nebraska did is this Kittredge without his hearing aids. <laughs> uh, anyway, I think, you know, Nebraska, I think it's an interesting film. I give him total credit. But yes, Alexander Payne is an established director being produced by a studio. You know, it was, I think, was it Paramount Pictures? Paramount. It was Paramount Pictures that, that um, you know, that produced the picture, and, and to his credit, he, you know, the studio did not want Bruce, and they also did not want black and white for Nebraska, and, and, and um, Alexander held out for it, and they said, well, you know, we'll let you, we'll give you a budget of $24 million if you, um, you know, make it with Robert Duvall in color, and he said no, and they said fine, we'll give you $13 million. You know, well, we made North, North Borders for $480,000. So my whole thing is that, is there a model for making movies in New England? And I think that I've come as close to the model working as you can get it. Which is making, I mean this film was made for 750,000. The reason that Northern Borders was made for less is because we shot the whole thing within one mile of Marlboro College and the college fed us and housed us and did everything. And they're not doing that anymore, so we have to pay for that stuff. But this is nothing compared to what the studios are spending. But you know, so you have to do it extremely economically. But I think you can still tell good stories, and they can still look good and be well acted, and you know, interesting actors can still be in them. And it's a model I believe in, but it's not a model that is institutionalized at any at any level. Now, in, if you were to think of this farther, and I don't want to go into a whole big deal, I mean, WGBH should be the source, you know, within New England, working in cooperation with the other public television stations to allow films like this to be made, because the budgets are very modest. And they should use their connections to market the DVD, to get, to get better TV deals, to you know, work foreign markets, to do that whole thing, because that's an organization that would have that potential, the PBS system as a whole. You know, but the money's not there. And so the question is, do we have a regional cinema? Do we have a cinema do we have a cultural cinema, or is, must it all be a commercial cinema? And so all I can do is do what I do, which is to act on what I believe in, which is a New England-based cultural cinema. And, and just come, certainly I realize at this point, that the money is, you just can't think about the money. It's theater. It's like dance. It's like theater. It's the arts. And, um, 
People say, oh, but the next one, I, you know, I'm way past that, you know. This is my seventh feature film. <laughs> and so anyway, so, so that's it. If you're inside this, you know, when Hollywood makes a TV deal, they are not accepting $10,000 from Showtime. I can tell you that right now. But that's because they own Showtime. And so they can run different numbers on it. That's, that's basically the bottom line. And people discover, I mean, I wish that Northern Borders could get more exposure. Uh, but it does get some exposure. <laughs> But I wish it would get more exposure. I mean, I think that, that Kittredge is also a pretty interesting character. And that Woody is, I mean, in my opinion, you know, he, he's, he's interesting, but he's, I think there's not as much going on there. Yeah, uh, could you talk a little bit about the cycle of pre-production that involves the students and the courses? Uh, how yeah. long did this take to prepare? Were the students involved in the scripting and that? It, just a, a general... Yeah. Picture of it we start with one week at the Sundance Film Festival. Say again? We start with one week at the Sundance Film Festival. The fall of, of um, the fall semester before we shoot, I go to the colleges that are participating. We do script workshops there for starters, where the students have read it, and we have like two or three hours of discussion, debate, you know, and that, and that basically informs me to go and make changes. And then once we're in session together, we do a week at the Sundance Film Festival, and then we do seven weeks of classes, a literature studies class, in this case related to Seaside, um, what did we do on this one? I guess we know we did Flaubert and Maupassant on this one. We then did a Seaside Cinema and, um, and Unusual Romance, I think was the focus of our cinema studies class. And then we do a, a writing and directing class that's six hours a week where we're focused just on the script. Script, 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 script read it, know it, have know every inch of the script because you're going to start seeing the script come to life in ways that are unexpected. Once we make a casting decision, everything changes. Once we make a location decision, everything else changes. Once we make a lighting decision, wow, that's what it looks like. Costumes, oh, I didn't imagine that. So that's part of what's the transformative process here is starting with a script, seeing the script change, and then seeing the movie change the script. And so it's six hours a week that's there. Also into that screenwriting class, we begin to bring the tapes of the actors. Um, and we talk about directorial approaches, directorial challenges. Students take turns. They work in groups to develop how they would shoot the scene if they were to be shooting the scene, blah, blah, blah. It all contributes to this longer dialogue. And, and it just so, it's, so we're, we're in a situation around a table for a minimum of six hours every week just talking about script and direction and casting. And so the script does go through changes. I come in with the script. I am also the person who ultimately authorizes changes to the script. And so I do keep control of the script, for sure. Um, that's what the project is. It, is. it is clearly the role of the mentor is important, but the role of the student is respected and they are expected to become peers and whatever they have to say or however they function is, an, is considered on an equal basis. So that's the goal. It's, it, it tends to be transparent and egalitarian, but it is a structure of mentorship. There's no question about that. We could do a different project, which is where students are making films, but <clears throat> it would be different. And we may do one like that. In fact, we may, I mean, I'm in conversation about you know, future iterations. I mean, right now, we're sort of committed to a Jack London story in 2018, his sort of intensely personal autobiographical story, Martin Eden. And so that's sort of what we're starting to think about now. Uh, I also have the rights to the story about the two Vermont kids that murdered the two Dartmouth College professors. It's been a controversial project from day one, and I don't know what's going to happen with it. But that probably won't be done through this model. Anyway, take one more question if anybody has one. If not, you know, come down, sign up, walk away with the loot. Where, where do students go from here? Well, they go back to their colleges, um, usually for a senior year. The colleges find them taking leadership roles and collaborating much better and you know, really having some inspiration to just sort of step it up about two notches. And well, that's good as far as we're concerned. They also, where they, if they want to work, they make contacts during this project, which is sort of the way you get work in the movie business, which is you have mentors, you have department heads that like you and take you along. And so, they, basically any of them that want to work, including the summer after we shoot, get that opportunity. 
Our goal, however, is to say this is not a technical training program. This is a, this is a, a holistic filmmaking program. In fact, if you're not even a film geek, fine. If you're a literature student, you know, this is fine, also good, because the collaboration, the sort of John Dewey idea of experiential learning is applicable beyond the question of whether you want to make movies. Um, but the fact is it has a solid liberal arts background and, and base, and so you're not just coming in to do technical stuff on somebody else's film. You're part of a team that we are trying to make holistic and also going through eight weeks of literature study, cinema study, screenplay, you know, theory, and the rest. And so, um, so it has an academic value, and that's important to us. But yes, students that want to be working in film, generally speaking, are working in film. I mean, I'm, I'm, and I've, I've, pra I've brought kids and students onto my projects. We've stepped up the roles they play. But the kid who made Beasts of the Southern Wild is a kid that I mentored, you know, years ago. There are two documentary filmmakers, Annie Stern and Ricky, uh, Ricky Stern and Annie Sundberg, who have won Emmy Awards for their documentaries. They did the Joan Rivers documentary about a couple of years ago, and you know they they met and started working, you know, on my project. The kid that wrote Iron Man, the first Iron Man, actually was my assistant on a film I made in 1996. So there are kids that go and they actually get into high positions in the industry. There are kids that are working in New England, because part of what we want to also say to them is you can make movies right here in New England. And some of them, that's what they do, and that's what they want to do. So anyway, you know, and we try to be supportive of them after they go, whether it's writing a recommendation or making a connection or saying to somebody we know who's a producer, here's a good person for you to take on. Um, I have a guy that worked on Northern Borders, actually, at a uh, low-level art department who's production designed three films that have played Sundance since then. That's only just four or five years, you know. So yeah, I mean, we want them to feel that ambition is not a curse which it generally is when you're working in the arts, you know, but uh, we want to give them a sense of possibility. Yeah. All right, well, tell your friends, if you like the film, to come check it out. Uh, we want to thank Barry and this theater for totally supporting my work.